Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our presentation this afternoon here at Thomas Welch Library. My name is Nora Schneider. I am the Library Genealogy Associate here at Thomas Welch Library. We are so excited for you to be joining us today for Andrew Jampoler's presentation on Congo, The Miserable Expeditions and Dreadful Death of Lieutenant Emery Taunt. I am going to just do a few housekeeping things and then I will not take up too much of your time so that I can hand it over to Mr. Jampoler. If you have any questions, we will be taking questions at the end. Please put them in the chat or the Q&A. Make sure that you are sending them to either Leesburg events or everyone so that I am able to get them and then I will pass them along to Mr. Jampoler. And so I wanna make sure that I see them. So that is to everyone or Leesburg events. That will not be the default. So you do need to set that to send those questions out. We will get to them at the end. If you are having any technical difficulties during this event, please email us at balchlib at leesburgva.gov and I will put that in the chat for everyone to see. We are here to help with any technical difficulties you may have. And again, if you have any questions, we will get to them at the end, but throughout the event, please feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A. Just check who you're sending them to, either everyone or Leesburg events. Without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Andrew Jampoler so he can tell us about the Congo. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Nora, and hello, everybody. I'm sorry I can't see you. I should start out by saying that the Balsh Library is, uh, has special affection in my heart. Uh, Susie and I lived in Leesburg, or north of Leesburg, for some 30 years, and Balsh was our home library, and it's for that reason that we're talking to you today. The story I'll tell you is a true story. It's a dreadful one uh, about the miserable expeditions and dreadful death of Lieutenant Emery Taunt in the Congo uh, many years ago. Uh, a place that tragically is still uh, a wretched suffering uh, uh, for its citizens. Let's begin uh, by quickly recapping how we got here. The first uh, talk in this series was on the slave trade at sea. And you'll recall I described slaves tragically as the first export of the continent. And the long effort at suppressing the state slave trade moved in two phases. The first was to terminate the transportation, the extraction of slaves from Africa and the transportation of them to markets. The second phase was uh, slowly to outlaw slavery itself. And uh, that was described in that first uh, presentation. We then took a more careful look at Africa. Uh, Henry Morton Stanley, The Great Explorations of Africa, that's his face there in the center slide in a lecture called Through the Dark Continent. and it. It was a discussion of how the world, the outside world, attempted to understand Africa through uh, these extraordinary expeditions of exploration uh, across Africa, principally uh, in the mind of many, uh, led by Henry Morton Stanley. Today, we'll be talking about uh, a quite a different phase in African history. Uh, it is uh, describing the period when slavery now has uh, been outlawed. Uh, all of a sudden, Africa becomes attractive as a site for colonies, the competition of European countries, to a lesser extent, the United States, the competition to uh, gain status and wealth and, and world power by the ownership of, uh, of colonies. And then the utterly, uh, well, then the extraction of resources from these colonies. In the case of Africa, the fantasy was that those resources would be powerful and a source of great wealth. Uh, they turned out principally to be ivory and rubber. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, the fantasy that African colonies would become huge markets, guaranteeing the wealth of the metropolitan country that, that owned the colony, huge markets for such things as cotton. It was the fantasy at one point that all the natives of Africa would need at least seven suits of clothes uh, two for weekends, uh, four during the week, and uh, one is pajamas. And this would represent an enormous market for the cotton mills of Europe. Anyway, with that background, that quick sweep of uh, African history, let's talk about one specific aspect of it, and that is Congo and the tragic history of Congo, a tragedy that continues to this day. 
Let's begin, since uh, we're hosted by a library, let's begin by talking about books on the subject that are related to what I'll be talking to you about today. There are many, they're excellent, and they're well known. Uh, Joseph Conrad, the Polish uh, slash British author, uh, famous for his storytelling, uh, specifically The Heart of Darkness, uh, which reflects his own experiences in the Congo on the river. Uh, Mark Twain, a social revolutionary at the time that he wrote uh, King Leopold's soliloquy. Uh, Twain, later in life, became a powerful voice for anti-colonialism. And this book, uh, an excellent one, is an expression of that sense. Arthur Conan Doyle, ship's doctor, uh, and a fascinating storyteller, the inventor of Sherlock Holmes, wrote a book based on his experiences and, uh, and his political leanings called The Crime of the Congo with a horrific cover picture of a young boy uh, suffering from amputations uh, that he's experienced. Uh, other books are King Leopold's Ghost, perhaps the best known book on the Congo by Adam Huxchild, a brilliant book that I recommend to you, uh, that everybody has recommended. The Poisonwood Bible, uh, this is a novel, but it's uh, set in Congo and a good story. Uh, Congo, the epic history of a people is a straight uh, historical look at it. Most recently, uh, one of Congo's great mysteries, and that is who killed the uh, secretary of the UN, secretary general of the UN, Doug Hammarskjöld. And there's a book there by Susan Williams that asks that question fairly recently. Uh, he was deliberately murdered, and Susan uh, attempts to make some sense out of who and why, uh, that, by whom and why that happened. Africa was in the way of Europeans who wished to sail uh, to the riches of Araby and to India. And it required enormous exercises in navigation in this period, uh, the 15th century, to get around this great continent. Uh, the Portuguese were the first to make a serious effort around the continent. And you'll see here Bartolomeu Diaz's route uh, to the tip of Africa, to the Cape, uh, outbound and inbound. That's what those two lines are about. And uh, the Portuguese got as far as the Rio Congo, we know for sure, up the river because they engraved on a stone on the Congo River that inscription that you see in front of you as, a, as an announcement that they had gotten that far. And obviously, as you look at this chart and you know the history, they got uh, the, all the way to Araby, the first traders, uh, and to India as well. So uh, the first Western connection to Africa and the Congo really was in its effort to avoid the continent and to move on to markets and resources that they thought uh, attracted them. Africa, and specifically Congo, were very difficult to explore, difficult to settle, uh, difficult to explore upriver for many reasons, and not the least of which a hotbed of diseases that for the most part were alien to Europeans for which there was no immunity and there was no uh, medical solutions to. These are lift, listed on the left to you. Uh, malaria is still a problem to, today. Uh, yellow fever, sleeping sickness, uh, and river blindness, horrific diseases that had terrific impact on people moving onto the continent from the sea for whatever reason. In exchange, Europeans delivered smallpox to Africa, a horrible disease that, that laid waste to populations. But these conditions drove the fact that exploring inland was very, very difficult, and it was effectively impossible to explore supported by beasts of burden because those beasts fell victim to the same diseases, sleeping sickness specifically, fell victim to the same diseases. So consequently, moving in and out of the continent was done by humans carrying uh, goods, porters carrying the equipment necessary to support these expeditions. Europeans had a vision of Africa, a vision of Congo, even before anybody seriously explored it. That notion was that it was peopled by fantastic people uh, looking nothing like themselves, tribal and uh, mysterious and, and somehow deficient. And, and these are some photographs that provide you some sense of the imagery that Europeans approached the continent with the notion of what was there 
And the other piece of what was there were fabulous beasts, uh, huge, unfamiliar to anybody from Europe and making the, the continent stranger still and more interesting still. Uh, there are very few of these uh, on that continent now, very few large uh, beasts uh, anymore. They have been hunted, uh, if not to extinction, close to extinction uh, for a variety of reasons. It's one of the great tragedies of Africa today. This vast continent is penetrated by uh, a number of complicated river systems, and these river systems provided access to the interior for the European and later American or Western explorers who wished to understand what was going on in Africa, how to exploit it, how to extract its wealth, how to uh, subject its peoples to uh, the colonial leadership of, of the metropolitan states of Europe. And this is a quick glance at those river systems. I will focus you uh, soon on the Congo River, which lies right here, this great arc of the river. But take a look briefly at the other river systems, the Nile, of course, and its tributaries. And down here, uh, flowing from uh, uh, east to west into the interior, and here flowing uh, down to, uh, to the ocean as well. So, uh, hey, I said east to west. Of course, they're, they're draining down into the water, so the flow is the other way. It was down here I was just pointing out. A quick glance at those principal river systems, to, comparing it to the major rivers of the world, the Nile here on top, the Amazon. Uh, the sizes of these charts represent the water discharge, the length of the river, and the size of the drainage basin. This is it. We get down here to what is labeled the Zaire. This is the Congo River, and it'll give you a sense of how it stacks up against the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, uh, the Amazon, of course, the, the great king of the rivers, and finally the Nile, very slender, very small, but very, very long. Uh, so we will be focused on the Congo River, this great bend here in the river as we talk. That river represents the principal transportation system of the country that uh, the colony that was the Congo, the country that today is the Congo. And this will show you in sort of sketch form just how important uh, the river is to the transportation of this vast interior uh, part of Congo. Here's the capital, Kinshasa, and out to the Atlantic at Banana Point right there. Uh, this map will show you the role that the Congo River plays in the transportation, especially if you glance down here at the key and discover that railways, paved all-weather highways, gravel highways, and earth tracks are about all that's left there. And in fact, very few of those railways, very little of the railway system operates. The paved roads are hardly paved today. And essentially, traffic moves up and down uh, on that river. Here is another glance at the river. This is an easier one to absorb. And I want to focus your attention specifically on the box down here, which is enlarged in the top left of the map. What we are enlarging is a section of the river that is from end to end rapids. This portion of the river from what is today Pool Malebo down to Matadi, and this Kikongo language meaning stones, this entire section of the river is not navigable. It has an extraordinary system of rapids. Uh, the Crystal Mountains run through right here. Extraordinary system of rapids that makes it unpenetrable on the surface. And consequently, you have to go around that portion of the river to go uh, from the Atlantic to the interior. Uh, the rest of Congo is landlocked for that reason. Let me show you that in some photographs, so you'll get a sense of it. This obviously is not a photograph, but these are. Uh, the river is impassable and has to be uh, circumnavigated on foot for most of the history of Congo by rail for a fairly brief period of time. I don't believe those rails, uh, railways run any longer. These are photographs that I took about 10 years ago of those uh, right here, of those rapids that mean the interior of Congo, the interior of Africa, is inaccessible to maritime trade uh, on the waters. As part of my research 
for the book that uh, I'll be describing to you quickly. As part of my research, my son and I elected to go down the river, duplicating one of Emery Taunt's uh, trips himself. Uh, we would go down the river from its headwaters at Stanley Falls. The rest of this now is as rapids again. Uh, the Lualaba down here is navigable, but not uh, through the rapids here. We would go down the river from from Stanley Falls around the great bend of the river down to Pool Malebo, what we used to be called Stanley Pool, to Kinshasa and overland down to the ends of the falls and finally by water again uh, to the Atlantic. And our effort was to understand the country and the role the river played in it and to get some sense of, of what that was like uh, for Emery Taunt and for that matter for Henry Morton Stanley and all the others who had explored, lived in, lived and died in the Great Basin of, of the Congo. Oops, there we go. Jason, this is my son Jason up here. He came along for many reasons, not the least of which is he was trained as an army medic and as an army nurse, and we thought that that kind of uh, help would be useful. The rest of our crew, uh, these four here, uh, helped us, didn't help, it made it possible to tell the truth, down the river in this boat right here. And at the very end of the river, after the rapids, we got into an even smaller one and continued down to the Atlantic. So this is our crew at the boat and we're up at the uh, headwaters up at the falls and heading down the river on this trip. Some other shots of us in the boat and the, and the shore. But the point of this graphic is to show you our route very specifically past a number of towns very early in the trip. And if you look at this red line and these dots, uh, what that represents is we carried a GPS system with us that every now and so often, about every hour or two, it sent a signal up to a satellite that bounced back down from that satellite to a GPS receiver that Susie, uh, living in Iowa at the time with our grandchildren, that Susie could receive. So the idea was that it would be possible for her to track our progress down the river and to reassure her that we were still afloat and moving down. Uh, sadly, the GPS system was experimental and it collapsed about a day and a half or two days into this expedition. So all of a sudden we disappeared from her screen, uh, raising some anxieties. This is what Congo looked like uh, 10 years ago. I can confidently tell you it looks like this today. It was our effort to understand the country, its people, its flora, its fauna and the region before getting down to the business of writing the book that I was gonna use to tell the story of Lieutenant Emery Taunt who lived and died miserably uh, during his expeditions on the Congo. Uh, so these are just pictures for you to glance at. Riverside communities, Riverside development. This is a barge moving along the river. It's tied up for the moment in a market town. Another view of the river and traffic along it or, or settlements or, or trading on the small islands that dot the river everywhere. One of the more fantastic sights we saw was this enormous barge being pushed by a tug that seemed to have a little bit of everything on it, people, cargo, products, goats, uh, all under uh, presumably the leadership of this man under a handsome green umbrella. But it'll give you a sense of the density of life there, the variety of life, and its extraordinary poverty. This is a close-up of that same barge floating on the river, uh, carrying people, products. Look at the enormous lumber here that's been cut out of the the Congo forest, and even their goats. These barges move, pushed by diesel tugs. There's one of these tugs there, another shot representing the people. Uh, those are not common on the river. They move up and down regularly, but what is much more common are dugout canoes, uh, canoes that would have been familiar to Emery Taunt, that would have been familiar to anybody on the Congo in the 19th century, uh, great dugout canoes, hauling people, hauling freight up and down the river as the principal avenue of transportation and commerce uh, in the river basin. Here's some communities along the shore. 
every night our boat tied up at one of these communities, we went ashore and asked their permission to camp with them. Uh, with one exception, that permission was quickly granted and we spent our nights as we proceeded down the river uh, camping uh, inside of these communities as well as welcome guests. Uh, one opportunity didn't turn out so well. We asked for permission and were instructed to leave. It was late in the evening, so we left, went down river, and pulled ashore uh, some distance away. Uh, in darkness, it turned out to be a bog. You'll see what we camped in this bog. Uh, here's our tent, uh, my son. Uh, it wasn't a real good decision to get ashore there, but by then it was dark and, and we didn't have a uh, uh, light to tell us a, a better place to go. I started out by telling you that the first connection of, of uh, West Africa Center, the core of Africa, to the rest of the world was the extraction of its first uh, and most tragic product, the extraction of slaves. These slaves were exported in enormous numbers, captured, brought to the coast, and transported to the various markets of North and South America, and also Araby and other parts of the world, uh, in these horrific conditions. You see here an illustration of a slaver moving across uh, across the ocean with people stacked like literally like cordwood lying there in chains as they're being delivered across the middle passage here, ultimately to the markets of North and South America. As we enter the period of colonialism, where uh, no longer slaves are the commodity being transported, but, but the, the colonies are being explored and exploited for whatever market goods they have, we end up with only two, really. Uh, the first of these was ivory, an absolutely fabulous material, obviously, from the trunks of elephants. And you see its enormous size uh, in the era we're talking about, these these tusks were enormous and they were everywhere because the elephant population of Africa was still uh, its original uh, strength. Take a look at this bottom left-hand picture and you'll get a sense of these uh, enormous tusks. The attraction of ivory was as a material that was possible to work in all kinds of ways. Uh, you and I think of ivory, I suspect, now as uh, the handles on, on tableware or on the keys of a piano. But take a look at the sculpture some artist has extracted out of one of these tusks, and you'll get an idea why ivory was such a precious commodity. Tragically, uh, it has markets still in the Orient for various reasons. It remains a precious commodity. And for this reason, we are witnessing the extinction of the great uh, African elephant herds, uh, and uh, that extinction will continue so long as there are any elephants left, unless we improve the quality of our policing a lot more than we've been able to in, in the recent past. The other resource, the other product that replaced slaves uh, as a commodity for export was rubber, the great natural rubber vines of the interior uh, these are uh, representative of those vines. Uh, Leopold, King Leopold of the Belgians, when he owned this property and was attempting to enrich himself with it, uh, compelled a quota, a, a latex rubber quota, on each of the peoples, each of the men and the various tribes that he controlled. And this pushed them out into the jungle uh, regularly for weeks at a time to extract the latex and return it. Rubber at this period is important because we're now starting to see bicycles and we're now starting to see automobiles. And it is being used essentially for the manufacturers of tires. It will be used for other things later. Uh, these are just beauty shots. What I'm showing you is late 19th century mapping of Congo. And this very high quality mapping will give you a sense of, of the quality of exploration, the quality of surveying that was behind it. We're looking at a very major effort of Europeans to understand what this continent was about, what it was like, and, and what, what it could contribute to the wealth and power of the metropolitan states. These are beautiful maps uh, by Letts in, in the late 19th century. 
There's a site on the internet, uh, David Rumsey, uh, a map collector who has very generously put up his collection, digitized it, put it up on the internet. And I commend it to you for absolutely beautiful maps of most places of the world. The, uh, the history of the Con Congo in the 19th century, early 20th, very early 20th century, is embedded in the autobiography, the biography of King Leopold II. I see a photograph, a painting of him, excuse me, a painting of him on the top right, and a sculpture of Leopold that is in Congo today, uh, looking down on the river. Leopold II was uh, king of the Belgians from 1865 to 1909 when he died. For part of that period, 1885 to 1908, he was the proprietor, the owner of the Congo Free State, the vast, mo most of what today is, is the Congo Republic. He owned personally uh, at, during this period from 1885 to just before his death, when Congo became a, a Belgian property, not his own personal property. And uh, he is the tragedy, he is the authority, he is the power behind some of the horrific abuses that parallel the introduction of Congo into the world system of states uh, during the late 19th century. That statue stands today uh, together with one that is collapsed next to him of Henry Morton Stanley uh, above the river, uh, very near the capital of Kinshasa. It's a cartoon illustration of the king. Uh, he uh, created Congo Free State as his personal property. He had the benefit of an, a wave of exploration uh, during the period of time that he ruled. Uh, the most famous of those uh, African explorers we spoke about earlier uh, in a previous discussion, Henry Morton Stanley, there are his dates. Uh, Stanley's a fascinating figure, uh, a Welsh uh, born in Wales, uh, into poverty, into neglect. Almost everything Stanley said about himself was complete fiction. But he was, in fact, quite accurately described, quite truly described, as one of the several great explorers of the world. During his lifetime, there's dates there on the right, during his lifetime, he made three epic voyages of discovery across the African mainland. Uh, the first one and the one that, that catapulted him into fame was the discovery of the missionary, medical missionary, uh, Dr. Livingston, the famous phrase, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Incidentally, uh, the judgment is that that phrase was never uttered. It was penciled into his diaries later uh, and then made, made uh, made him into something of a laughing stock because it's such a stiff and awkward expression. But he was a brilliant explorer with a constitution that was amazing. He survived those diseases I described to you again and again in three expeditions, months long expeditions across the continent. There's Livingston, the uh, medical missionary I described to you. His discovery. Uh, in, in the center of, of Africa by, by Stanley was the famous moment that catapulted uh, uh, Stanley into fame uh, as an explorer and that forever give us uh, the expression of Dr. Livingston, I presume. Stanley's route during his second expedition was an extraordinary passage across all of the center of, of Africa, you see it start there at, at Zanzibar, just a, a shore at Zanzibar uh, in November 1874. And he will go across the entire center of Africa, the entire river systems and end up at the mouth of the Congo three years later, still alive, uh, still in fairly good health, having accomplished something that uh, remains uh, unbelievable today, having crossed the continent on foot in the face of its disease, in the face of its geography, and all the other threats. I mentioned to you that his statue is right next to the statue of King Leopold. 
above the capital of Kinshasa. This is that statue. It has long since fallen down, and it lies there uh, in this condition as you see it. The picture on the left is uh, Henry Morton Stanley in 1885. Uh, I'm fascinated by it because the hat uh, added about six inches to his height. He was a man of relatively small stature, and uh, and it's quite quite a chapeau. This the statue above, top left, is supposedly the moment when Stanley meets Livingston, his handout to utter the great phrase, the famous phrase, Dr. Livingston, I presume. That statue was in Wales, where uh, Stanley, despite his claims of American birth, American citizenship, uh, repeated claims, where he was born and spent the first uh, years of his life in, in a poor house uh, and ultimately left uh, to pretend that he'd never been there for some period of time. The great American mover and shaker of the role the United States played in the Congo, in the Congo Free State, was a man named Henry Sanford, Henry Shelton Sanford from Connecticut. Uh, his role grew from the fact that he was ambassador to, uh, to the court, the Belgian court, and he had a close relationship with King Leopold. Uh, he would become fascinated by the possibilities of the Congo for personal wealth. He would push the United States into uh, being the first country, quite remarkably, to diplomatically recognize uh, Leopold and the Congo Free State, this, this privately owned property that he pretended was a country with a flag. This was all uh, a consequence of Henry Sanford's relationship with Leopold and with his business interests that he saw would profit enormously from the resources of the Congo. He was the, the impetus behind American diplomatic recognition. He was the impetus behind the efforts the American government placed in several people to explore the resources of the Congo to understand the potential of its markets. Uh, he is incidentally the namesake for the city of Sanford, Florida. He was an investor in Florida real estate at the bottom left in Connecticut is his tombstone uh, uh, where he is buried. Uh, I've boxed a part of the epitaph on it where it describes him as founder of the city of Sanford, Florida, and one of the founders of the Congo Free State. And that's a fair description to his uh, eternal shame. Uh, he was, in fact, one of the founders of the Congo Free State because he legitimized King Leopold's efforts uh, internationally and in the eyes of the United States especially. As the interest in Europe grew for understanding what was in Central Africa or understanding what was in Africa and apportioning out the colonies, the potential colonies, uh, the effort was conducted under the leadership of Bismarck at the Berlin Conference, which met at the end of 1884 into early 1885, the cartoon there uh, shows Bismarck standing up before the delegates of that conference and announcing that it was time to cut up the cake that was Africa and to apportion it among the European countries who sought colonies and the imagined wealth that these African colonies would provide. This period plays itself out against the backdrop of the presidencies of these men, Arthur, Cleveland, and, and Roosevelt, and they would all play a role in deciding how the United States would approach Africa, would approach the ambitions of Europeans and colonists uh, in Africa. The first expression of this was sending a man called Tisdall, uh, a businessman, a man who spoke interestingly of four languages, and who had extensive business in, uh, in South America and, and extensive experience living in South America, Tisdall was sent to Africa as the first effort of the United States government to explore what the river basin was like, the Congo River Basin was like, and to explore if there were opportunities specifically for American business on the river. As those explorations and efforts unfolded, 
this became an interest more generally in the United States. And because American Navy had easy access to the African coast, and it was difficult to get there any other way, it fell to the Navy to send the second uh, effort to understand the Congo, its market, its peoples, and so on. It fell to the US Navy to support the second effort uh, behind Tisdall's. And it was under the, these two Navy secretaries that that second effort was made. And the decision was to send, quite remarkable decision when you think about it, to send a naval officer ashore up the Congo River to examine yet again what the country was like, what the place was like, it's not a country, and what the opportunities were like. And this was easy to do because the United States Navy generally maintained a ship presence off the African coast in this area. This is the mouth of the Congo River. There is Banana Point, And that was the anchorage at which commercial vessels and, and naval vessels anchored in preparation for sending expeditions or, or commercial vessels or commercial vehicles uh, up the Congo River. Now, here we are at the edge of the Atlantic. Uh, and that port, for a while, was the most valuable piece of real estate anywhere in, in uh, Christendom, so to speak. It was enormously important because it was the access point to the imagined wealth and riches of the Congo. After Tisdall goes up the river, the United States Navy is instructed to send, to put somebody ashore to duplicate his expedition, to duplicate his investigation. And that will be done uh, because the USS Kearsar, shown here in this painting, is being transferred from the European squadron in the Mediterranean to the South Atlantic squadron off the east coast of South America. And during the course of her transit from station to station, she will be instructed to drop off an officer at Banana Point, send him up the river, and again study what it is, the peoples, the markets, the resources up the river, to help the United States think through how it might participate in the exploitation of this great interior continent. So there is a, a painting of Kearsarge. Uh, she will be the vessel uh, that will uh, will drop off the, uh, the naval officer. Kearsarge is famous in, in Navy history as the ship that fought the Confederate commerce raider Alabama off of Cherbourg, France in June 1864, some 20 years plus before what we're talking about. This is a painting by Manet of that battle off the French coast, uh, absolutely famous battle. It was uh, one of the great successes of the US Navy's effort to suppress commerce raiding, uh, which was itself one of the great successes of the Confederate States Navy, practically the only success. They managed to beat up the American whaling fleet uh, in the Bering Sea very badly, but otherwise uh, it's, naval actions, naval activities were largely focused on American commerce, which had the effect of driving the Northern Merchant Marine off the seas for a while uh, during the course of the war. This is a painting of, of Lancaster in 1892 off Naples. It give you an idea what a lovely ship she was. She will end up uh, taking Emery Taunt, Lieutenant Emery Taunt, a member of the Admiral's staff, and dropping him off at the mouth of the Congo River. I'll show you an illustration of the absolutely stunning figurehead uh, that the ship has. Uh, this is in the uh, Mariner's Museum. The uh, figurehead is by uh, uh, a man named Bellamy, and it is in the collection of the Mariner's Museum. This is the staff of the European squadron as they will drop off Lieutenant Emery Taunt uh, there he is uh, in, this, in this photograph right here. He will be dropped off at the mouth of the river with instructions to proceed up the river and file what amounts to a business analysis of the Congo. Now, there's no reason to believe that he had any special qualifications for this. His only special qualification was the fact that his father-in-law, standing right there in, in that handsome admiral's uniform, was the squadron commander 
and it's not clear to me whether he sent Emery Taunt up the river to enhance his his professional reputation and his uh, his uh, standing in uh, among naval officers, or to complicate his life enormously, uh, given the reasons that the travel in the Congo was so dangerous. But there is the admiral, and he will send Emery Taunt up the river on what is the second effort for the United States to figure out whether the Congo represents an opportunity for the U.S. Taunt uh, had a fascinating Navy history up until day, this date. He was one of the men, one of the officers, who participated in the rescue of the U.S. Army's Greeley expedition in Arctic Canada, an expedition that turned into a catastrophe as the Greeley expedition members went down the coast to be recovered after three years on the Canadian Arctic. They ended up stranded ashore, living in what amounted to a dugout igloo, uh, resorting to cannibalism, absolute horror story. Taut was on board the vessel that found uh, the few survivors, there were seven originally, ended up being only six, of this army expedition that had spent uh, two and a half, three years in Arctic Canada. There is a picture of the expedition survivors right here. And here is Lieutenant Emery Taunt on board the flagship, uh, having participated in this rescue that was famous because it was the first time in a long time that the US Navy had done something uh, so successful that it was praiseworthy uh, after the Civil War. Taunt will be dropped off then at Banana Point here at the mouth of the river, he will proceed up the Congo to its headwaters and back down and file a report. So he's dropped off here. Uh, he will ride up the river partially as far as he can go in, in one of the local steamers and to get to Boma, the capital of this fake Congo Free State, the property of, of King Leopold. This is a, a vision, uh, an engraving of what that capital looked like in this period. And it's right up here, just where the rocks start and the great uh, section of the river becomes impassable. Uh, there is Boma. This is a photograph of the capital uh, of the country at the time, the building that was the uh, capital building. That's a photograph of about 11 years ago, 12 years ago when I took it. And it'll give you a sense of what that building looked like, minus some of these porches here, when Leopold was king. Down underneath here is the head of, of his, the statue of King Leopold. This was the capital uh, building of, uh, of the Congo Free State. You'll then go up the river all the way, on the way, uh, in part by steamboats carried up in pieces. You see here uh, around the rapids, everything had to be portaged by porters. And there's a piece of one of these steamboats being carried up the river, past the rapids. It will be assembled past the rapids and then proceed to provide services up and down the river from there. Most of everything that moved into Congo, into the center of Congo, was carried there by porters who had 65 pound loads, uh, roughly, on their heads, on, on padded cushions on their heads, and carried these loads around the 200 miles of the rapids and then further upriver until finally uh, steam navigation was developed on the river. This is a monument, a badly abused monument to these porters. And you can see those expressions of intense suffering and fatigue. That's appropriate. These men marched dozens of miles a day carrying these packs uh, on their heads, 65-pound uh, packs, uh, and they were what brought in the products and produce of the West up into the center and brought out whatever it was being carried out of Congo. This centerpiece of that monument is down by the railroad station some dozens of miles away. Ultimately, uh, a railroad was built to, to skirt the rapids so that porters were not required any longer. That railroad was, uh, when I went through Congo, in horrific condition. This is the engine house of the railroad. This is the tracks and the bridges on one area. Uh, 
uh, what was carrying the, the freight uh, during the period of time that my son and I were there was trucking around that same, uh, same uh, River Rapids area. The capital was Leopoldville then, it is Kinshasa now, Kin La Belle, Kin Kinshasa the Beautiful. Uh, it was called after the emperor, uh, the king then. And this is an image of, of Stanley Pool, the great open water pool just beyond where the capital sits. So their capital sits here. This is Stanley Pool. It's now called Pool Malibu. This is a satellite shot. And this is our boat uh, tied up on that pool. Uh, as we finished our expedition down. Everything moved up and down the river, past the rapids, uh, by these steamers. The connection with the Arimi River is famous because of, of a, a Stanley expedition that ended up uh, coming apart almost on that river. All the way up the river to where it is once again impassable at Stanley Falls. Right from there, down the Lualaba, uh, the river once again becomes unnavigable. And that is why well, we have Kisangani up here, uh, the principal town, because that is the end of navigation. Uh, there's the intersection of uh, the Congo River and the Aruimi right here is made notorious by Stanley's second expedition, which almost came apart uh, right on that river. These uh, enormous logs are carved out into dugout canoes. And as I showed you a, a while ago, and as you can see here, those dugout canoes are still an important vehicle of transportation on this river. Emery Taunt files his report on what he has seen uh, in his expedition, backing up that first expedition on the river, and the report will be, uh, as you would suspect, uh, legalistic and not especially uh, in depth because it's just a limited amount of, of time and, and limited expertise. But it will be the second serious effort the United States makes to understand what it has done and how it might profit from the development of this, uh, of this colony, this property of the king. Taunt is a drunkard. He will, a number of times in his career, and the end of his career, will be a consequence of the abuse of alcohol. Uh, the Navy will separate him uh, after court-martial uh, for uh, alcohol abuse, and he will, uh, in this capacity, return to the Congo, in this condition, return to the Congo twice more. The first expedition was uh, as a naval officer filing a report to the government. The second time he will be in the Congo was uh, hired by Henry uh, Sanford, uh, there in, in the top coat, hired by Sanford as chief of something called the Sanford Exploring Expedition, which is an effort on Sanford's part to monetize his, uh, his interests and his status uh, as an inside man with a king, Sanford is trying to figure out a way how to export ivory from the Congo, and he needs a man on the ground to run this team that he will send up there under the guise of a scientific effort, and it will turn out to be a taunt. Taunt will, in civilian status, be selected by Sanford. This is the letter appointing him uh, to Emory Taunt, Lieutenant Emery Taunt, USN, you're hereby appointed chief of the Sanford Exploring Expedition. And in 86, he will go up the river. And again, uh, uh, he will have trouble with the abuse of alcohol. And the expedition will not succeed in exporting any of the ivory. And Taunt uh, will be fired ultimately by Sanford. Sanford will continue to attempt to exploit this under the leadership of other people he will hire. But Emery Taunt will return uh, for a second time uh, down the river and back to the United States, uh, this, this time now uh, unemployed and in real trouble. This is a, a picture of Sanford's steamboat that he intended to assemble on the river and use to explore the river, but most significantly 
uh, to bring down uh, whatever wealth he could uh, initially and principally in the form of ivory. This under the guise that this was some sort of a scientific expedition. Here is that steamboat uh, on the left picture uh, being a, a commissioned. She's now been finally assembled, put together, put to, on the river. And here she is at the mouth of the Arawimi River in operation. Taunt's wife will suffer through uh, his problems both in the Navy and as a civilian, and she will fairly soon, as I will describe to you, suffer through his death on the river. This is a letter she has sent uh, to the Navy asking him to look with leniency upon her husband. These fearful attacks, she's referring to not to disease, but to drunkenness, uh, come upon him at times, and he seems to have no control over himself. The result will be Taunt's career will collapse in, uh, in court-martial following uh, a, a number of catastrophic episodes when he is under orders uh, to join USS Nipsic at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. He's under orders to join the ship. Nipsic is scheduled to sail for the Pacific to participate in some uh, very delicate uh, political military events in Samoa. This is the U.S. Navy Yard, New York. Taunt disappears from the Navy Yard and is gone for an extended period of some weeks. He is finally tracked down in a hotel, uh, living indecently and having suffered a number of attacks of uh, alcoholism. He will be court-martialed uh, for this condition and ultimately separated from the Navy. Nipsick, the ship you see here, will sail on schedule uh, for the Pacific under the command of Commander Dennis Milan. She will be in Apia Harbor in Samoa in March 1889 when a horrific typhoon blows up in Samoa and destroys all the shipping in the harbor. Nipsic is here among other Navy vessels. They're all there because Germany, Great Britain, and the United States are all trying to figure out how to get a piece of Samoa, how to colonize Samoa, what the advantages to that colony would be. And when the typhoon hits, only a single Royal Navy ship has the good sense to escape the harbor out to sea. She will survive. All the other vessels, German, American, and other British vessels, and the commercial transports that are in the harbor will be destroyed. Uh, that will, as you might suspect, uh, uh, end the career of, of the captain of, of Nipsic. Although not as, as quickly as you'd think, because this is, uh, typhoon is regarded by the Navy as an act of God that no one could have been prepared for. The letter you see here is Taunt applying for the job of the first American consul in Congo. This, the United States government establishes the idea that they need to have a commercial representative in Congo, uh, effectively the only diplomat in Congo, American diplomat in Congo. Taunt applies for that position. And as part of his application, he writes the president and he says, this is a vehicle. First, he knows more about Congo than anybody else in the United States. But this will be a vehicle where he can restore his reputation and his good name. And that uh, restoration will be his recompense since the pay for this uh, assignment is very, very austere, very limited. The job is completely underfunded. And, uh, and the calculation is he will make only a few dozen dollars as the first resident consul of the United States in Congo. And this is the register of the American consuls in Boma, Congo Free State. And you'll see his name there on the register, uh, Emery Taunt, uh, leading the list. We don't have to talk about these others, but they were his successors. And he will be the official diplomatic representative of the United States in Congo if he is selected for this job. Uh, in fact, he will be selected to be the consul, and he will proceed on the river 
uh, and start to work. The river will attract, uh, and the fact that it is a colony of the king and the abuses of that colony will attract the interest of all sorts of, of other people. Interestingly enough, fascinatingly enough, one of them will be a Ukrainian merchant sailor, or Polish, depending on where the border was at that time, merchant sailor named Joseph Conrad. Uh, that's his, his anglicized name. Uh, his uh, Ukrainian name is, is near unpronounceable. Uh, Conrad is famous for several reasons. One, he is a seaman of real capacity, real capability. He is a sailor, a merchant sailor, uh, and, uh, sailing in many of the interesting places of the world. And as he experiences the, those uh, cruises, he starts to write. And he writes brilliantly. Uh, not simply brilliantly, but in English is a language that he doesn't speak until he's in his 20s. Uh, he is in Congo looking for a job as a ship captain, boat captain, on one of the river boats during the period of time that we're talking about. And he will, this will be the source of that brilliant book of his, uh, Heart of Darkness. Another man who will end up in Congo pass through Congo and inform us uh, today of what that experience was like is a black man named George Washington Williams, who will explore Congo in the time of Leopold and write a damning analysis of the, of the conditions in the colony that he sees there, a very clear-eyed report on the horrors of Congo. And this will be one of the contributions to a movement that develops to change the status of Congo, to eject Leopold, and to fundamentally change the place uh, Congo plays, uh, the free state, in quotation marks, plays in the politics of the world. There will be another, uh, a number of other players in the politics of Congo. One of the most famous of these is, is an Irishman named Roger Casement. Uh, this is a picture of him as is the British consul in Congo surrounded by some uh, black youngsters. Uh, born in 1864, he will be the consul in Congo at the turn of the century. There's a photograph of him in that status. He will be executed after a trial for disloyalty in 1916. Caseman is a social reformer. He is also an Irish patriot. And during the course of the First World War, he works very hard to arm the Irish to fight against the British. He ends up uh, on the wrong side of the politics of that as the war ends. He will be tried uh, for treason, a judge guilty, and, and executed. But the reason he is in this story is because as Congo consul for the United Kingdom, he will report very clearly and very persuasively on the abuses of the king uh, that uh, that he has seen in that colony. This is a, a cartoon of Casement uh, in prison, uh, and this is a, a painting of his trial, a report in the uh, local newspaper about Sir Roger's uh, last words af as his execution, and Irish stamps commemorating uh, the role of the patriot that he was uh, there are a number of other people who will motivate, who will create the public movement that will profoundly change the political status of Congo. Uh, one of them is Edmund Morel, uh, French-born British uh, citizen, uh, modest, uh, modest upbringing. He will work as a shipping clerk in a company called Elder Dempster Shipping. Elder Dempster is one of the Liverpool companies that moves uh, ships back and forth to Congo. And he will, as a clerk, be struck by the imbalance of cargoes as Elder Dempster ships move back and forth from Africa. The ships coming from Africa are carrying uh, ivory and rubber, uh, commodities of great wealth, uh, making a lot of money for, for the owners. The ships curiously going to Africa are carrying nothing but arms and ammunition. No products that are of any use to civil society 
And Morel begins thinking about this, and he realizes the horrific exploitation that it must be going on as reflected in trade that has precious commodities moving one way and the instruments of subjugation uh, moving the other. He and others will create, in 1904, the Congo Reform Association. And this association will be a loud and persuasive voice agitating for change in the Congo, agitating for, I apologize for the sirens in the background, there's something going on in Washington, obviously, agitating for a profound change in the governance uh, and, and the mechanisms that are being used to control the native peoples of Congo. Others will get caught up in the so, this social movement as well. Famously, Mark Twain, his, uh, his dates are there. You and I know Twain as, as the great storyteller of the Mississippi River. He will, as he ages, become generally horrified by American colonialism. Uh, that horror will, will be most explicit as he contemplates the abuses, uh, American abuses in the Philippines flowing from the Spanish-American War. Uh, Twain will become an active reformer, a voice for reform, a persuasive and influential voice for reform. And in his uh, attention span, he will encompass the Belgian Congo and also join the Congo Reform Association and be one of the spokesmen uh, for the purposes of that association. His uh, comments will be, his, his role will be so effective that it will persuade the king to publish a pamphlet, to have a pamphlet published. It's called An Answer to Mark Twain. This Morel there is also. Uh, this is the cover of that pamphlet, which shows Mark Twain as a serpent orbiting overhead the present Belgian Congo. There on the right, a peaceful, tranquil, all illuminated industry and, and prosperity, farms and everything. Uh, this pamphlet will be an effort to respond to Twain's criticisms and brilliant critique of the abuses of the king uh, in the Congo. It will be an effective piece of propaganda uh, to, uh, to accomplish that. Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, you know him in a different role entirely. Arthur Conan Doyle will also uh, speak up uh, for reform in the Congo. Uh, and there is his book uh, uh, published in New York, The Crime of the Congo. Uh, there's uh, on the left, obviously, Conan Doyle. He will be another of the persuasive, well-known, influential voices arguing that what Leopold is doing in Congo is a crime. He is abusing horrifically its natives, forcing them into labor, uh, under ter horrific conditions, and uh, these voices will coalesce around the expulsion of Leopold from proprietorship of what pretended to be the, the uh, Congo Free State. That will succeed. Leopold will back off, even uh, while he is still king, he will back off from this property and the Belgian legislator, legislature will take Congo off as, over as a colony of the country rather than as the personal property of, of the king. And that will endure, that status will endure from little after turn of the century through the middle of the year 1960, quite remarkably, for, for decades, when the then king of Congo, uh, king of uh, Belgium, will give up what had become a, a property not of, of him, of his father, actually, personally, or the legislature, the state uh, parliament. Uh, he will give it up uh, and yield Congo back to its native peoples. This is a parade uh, through Kinshasa. Uh, it's a photograph from Time magazine of June the 30th, 1960 showing the then king riding his limousine through the center of town 
as a, an event during the return of Congo to its own peoples. And one of these people's bystanders uh, watching the parade rushes up to the king's limousine, the young king's limousine, and steals his ceremonial sword. And this is a photograph of Time magazine of that moment of, uh, let's say, majesty when, when the sword of the king of the Belgians is taken from him, symbolically, I think, marking the end of Belgian rule, Belgian control, parliamentary control in this case, uh, over the Republic of Congo. So that's how that part of the story ends. Um, the story that I've just described to you is told uh, in more detail and more, uh, I would hope more uh, eloquently in a book published uh, over here about 10, 12 years ago uh, called Congo, The Miserable Expeditions and the Dreadful Death of Emery Taunt, Lieutenant Emery Taunt, United States Navy. So I thank you very much for your time and attention. All the books I have mentioned in this talk are on my uh, website, maintained by my computer literate wife. Uh, this is an image of that website, and it also will give you links uh, to the previous talks if, uh, if these stories are of interest to you. Down in the bottom, uh, the books that uh, I've written, maritime history books on uh, uh, the first on a uh, Navy aircraft that goes down off of a Russian Kamchatka uh, during the Cold War. Uh, Sailors in the Holy Land, a really odd expedition in the 1840s. The United States Navy sends uh, down the Jordan River and onto the Dead Sea. The last Lincoln conspirator uh, is a story about literally uh, the last of the Lincoln assassins to be brought to trial. Uh, horrible shipwreck is the story of uh, a British convoy, a convict transport going to the Australian Cal penal colony, uh, running aground in France and what happened. Uh, Black Rock and Blue Water, uh, a hurricane in the Caribbean. And uh, Embassy to the Eastern Courts. Uh, a fascinating expedition, diplomatic expedition, the United States sends uh, to Southeast Asia looking for commerce, looking for a relationship with uh, the Kingdom of Siam and the other places in, in Southeast Asia. So I thank you for your time and attention. I hope the story of Emery Taunt uh, interests you. It's a, in one respect a, a tragic story, tragic certainly for Taunt, whose character flaws and his weaknesses uh, led to his, his horrible death uh, at Banana Point while he was still a consul, or he thought he was still consul, or the burial party thought he was still the consul of the United States. In fact, days before he had been, uh, he died, uh, he had been fired in a telegram uh, sent uh, through a very roundabout way of delivery to him at, at Boma, the capital, he'd been fired, and in fact, he died unemployed, an alcoholic, stricken with disease. When they came months later to recover his body and to return it home for burial, they were unable to find uh, his remains at Banana Point where he'd been buried uh, in the sands, uh, perhaps even below the water table. And consequently, Emery Taunt remains at Banana Point, a place that he first saw as a young naval officer, next saw uh, as a commercial enterprise that ran on the rocks badly, and finally, uh, and he hoped uh, triumphantly, saw as the first American diplomat in that uh, part of the continent first American diplomat who failed and died in that part of the continent. So thank you very much uh, for your time and attention. Uh, Nora, if there are uh, questions I can answer uh, uh, in this format, I'd be happy to. Otherwise, uh, I'll respond uh, by email or whatever else is appropriate. Thank you so much for that informative presentation. Wonderful as always. Could you talk a little bit about how you came to this topic and what interested you about this topic and led you to take a trip 
following the path yourself? Let me answer those questions backwards. Um, Susie led my wife led me uh, to take the trip uh, because she quite rightly said, "How how can you write about a Congo persuasively and authentically, and having never been there?" And we have in in the other books I've described to you, in each instance, gone to these places, uh, done research on site. Uh, met the local archivists or the local uh, scholars, librarians, whomever, uh, so that we have some confidence that, that this is authentic. It's not imaginary. And it was her comment that you got to go there to be able to write about the river. Uh, and uh, our deal was that I could go if we took, our, if I took uh, my army medic son with me. Uh, he went. Uh, carrying 50 or 60 pounds of emergency medical equipment, uh, everything from Israeli battle dressings to needle and thread and sutures and all kinds of things, um, because this is a, a dangerous place. Uh, while we were there, before we went and after we came back, the US Embassy regularly published uh, what amounted to telegrams to the world announcing what conditions were like there, what diseases were prevalent, what the problems were. Uh, so consequently, we went prepared uh, for all kinds of medical disasters. Happily, uh, none of those happened. We both remained healthy. And uh, before we left Congo, we gave away all these medical supplies to a maternity hospital that we happened to stumble across uh, at the very end of our trip uh, uh, along the uh, Atlantic coast. And uh, I suspect that package of stuff, battle dressings and everything, uh, might have been more than they needed, but I also suspect it was the only things they had in that entire facility, entire infirmary, that were actually sterile and safe to use. Uh, conditions there were just everywhere were tragic. It was hard not to weep when you saw the circumstances under which people were living. I I would like to think, but I doubt, that that has improved. Um, so that, uh, that uh, the inspiration for the trip. All these other books uh, have, have similar backstories. Uh, ADAC was easy to write. I flew that airplane uh, myself uh, out of Alaska uh, under those same conditions. I knew the crew as I wrote the book. Uh, Sailors in the Holy Land, Susie and I went, uh, uh, we, we began in, uh, in Istanbul where, where the US crew, US Navy crew that went there had to get permission. This was all uh, uh, Turkish property there uh, at the time and proceeded down to the Holy Land, uh, down the Jordan River uh, and so on, uh, writing the story of this bizarre US Navy expedition that uh, in 1848, went to explore the River Jordan, uh, measure the elevation of the Dead Sea and its depth and bottom conditions. Uh, last Lincoln Conspirator, we did the same thing, uh, going to uh, all the places that are described in the story. Uh, John Surratt, the man we're writing about, uh, was a papal zouave uh, for a while. Uh, when the United States decided to go after him and put him on trial for his suspected role in the assassination of Lincoln, uh, we went we went to the uh, uh, to Rome uh, to the secret archive, the Vatican secret archive. I put that in quotation marks because it's got a sign above it. It's not a big secret. Exploring the fact that uh, Surratt was a member of the Papal Zouaves, he was arrested in Egypt, attempting to flee arrest. Uh, he was caught by the American consul there still wearing the uniform of the Pope's army, brought back to the United States, put on trial, and, and, and. Uh, horrible shipwreck, same thing. We, we went to Boulogne in the archives there. We read about what happened to this uh, transport vessel that uh, ran aground in a horrific storm in the channel, uh, ended up with the death of all the women, all the children, and virtually the entire crew uh, as they were being taken uh, to the prison colony in Australia. Uh, Congo, we've just talked about, Black Rock and Blue Water, a hurricane in the Caribbean. Uh, we did the same kind of research uh, going there. Um, 
I, I think you need to be on the ground in these places and look at the local archives and get a feel for the geography and and even talk to the people before you can write convincing history. Uh, and uh, that was certainly true in Congo. Although as I look back on it, I was a little bit crazy to do that. But uh, could not have written written the story uh, and had a good feel for it without. And, and some of the days on the river are beautiful. I mean, this is an absolutely extraordinary uh, piece of geography. And uh, as you're going down this river, studded with tiny islands, you're passing people on dugout canoes that could have been there a century ago and would have looked exactly the same standing up and fishing and anyhow that's that's where that came from we spoke before about some thoughts that you had about the photo you chose to use as your background for your presentation and i just i thought it was it was a beautiful thought would you would you mind sharing that with everyone else who's here today gee if i could remember it i would i <laughs> I, I, I selected that. You're talking about the cover photo? Yeah, the cover photo, the photo yeah. you chose for the cover it's, of the book. It's just absolutely beautiful on the river. If you put aside, and it's hard to put aside, the poverty, the exploitation, the history of exploitation. Uh, and if you just look, this is the nose of our boat. <laughs> if you just look at the river, it's stunning, studded with islands, uh, a great broad expanse and flowing to the sea and carrying with it uh, the history of, of centuries of uh, Central Africa. It was uh, it, it was enormously moving. Uh, and I thought that this photograph uh, that, that is the cover illustration gives you a sense of, of the geography and the vast open space and and the mystery of of uh, Central Africa and, and all in in one co what you don't see in that picture is our boat was full of yellow cans plastic cans full of gasoline for the little Yamaha motor we had in the back of it those plastic cans are the utility containers of Congo they originally hold palm oil and as soon as that palm oil is drained they become water containers uh, uh, gasoline containers, you know, as I say, the utility canteen of the Congo. One point going down the river, um, I, I notice our, uh, our our boat guy swirling around one of these containers, uh, and I say, hey, you know, what are you doing? We had one one of the crew spoke English. He was a, a former missionary and had gone to spend a little bit of time in England, and he was our translator. And the explanation was they had put, uh, this had been a gasoline container. Uh, we had run out of drinking water and their solution was to take the river water, put some sand in it, swirl out the container, the plastic can, uh, to presumably get rid of the gasoline. And then we were gonna fill it with Congo water and use that to drink. And I said, no, we weren't gonna do that because I was certain it would kill us. And I believe that to this day. But it was just one of these moments of, boy, here you are in, in a different part of the world doing different things. And, and it's pretty damn thrilling. And it was. Anything else? We've talked before and in past presentations about how we're in a moment of time where many people are looking back on the history of our country and the history of the world and re-examining it. Um, some people call it revisionist history. You're about 10 years out from your trip to the Congo and writing the book. Is is there any aspect of this topic that you think people are looking at differently now in 2022? Or do you think that will become part of this re-examination of history? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um... Revisionist history. I, I think that Congo remains one of the great tragedies of, of world history. We, uh, we in, 
in the northern hemisphere and the western world and in the first world have done a lousy job of sharing the wealth. And uh, the result is this tremendous divide between the hemispheres. And what we're seeing now, and I, I speak as a former refugee myself, what we're seeing now is the global south has through a variety of means, travel, uh, the internet, uh, all kinds of different means, discovered that the, the conditions under which they're living are miserable, but there is better in, in the global north, in the northern hemisphere. And I think this is the stimulus, or one of the stimuli, for the movement of, of refugees north, uh, pressing hard against the borders of, of Europe, North America, and, uh, and the wealthier part of the world, as people uh, desperately look for a way to live better and recognize that where they are, uh, that's impossible. Uh, the pressures this put on immigration and, and relief and assistance are enormous. I think the pressures that we're responding to are not responding particularly successfully. Uh, I think nobody in the global north is responding successfully. And of course, on top of that, that whole movement that is driven by economics and, and conditions in life, on top of that is, is conflict, which is stimulating enormous numbers, of, especially in Europe now, of refugees. Um, I think... Uh, I think that the world is a long way from, uh, it, I, if it's perfectible, it's a long way from perfection. And I think that this is visible today in Africa south of the Sahara, for that matter, Africa north of the Sahara as well, as, as people attempt to flee uh, conditions that are unlivable in the desperate search uh, for conditions that are livable. And this has, of course, nothing to do with Ukraine, but, but there's a dimension of that there too. That's much more philosophical than I intended to be. I apologize for that, but I've been thinking a lot about it lately as, uh, as someone who was born in what is today Ukraine. And, uh, and I, I lament the fact that we're not doing a very good job of managing the expectation, the desperate expectations of people who have become refugees. And Congo, going back to Congo, uh, we're not doing, uh, we the world, we the Western world, the wealthy world, the Northern Hemisphere are not doing a good job in, in understanding that we share planet Earth and uh, we better figure out a way to share it on a basis that uh, is more stable and more peaceful in what we're experiencing right now. Well, we thank you again for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us in this wonderful presentation. And we thank everyone for attending our Thomas Welch Library luncheon lecture with Andrew Jampoler. And we hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Nora, let me just add one thought to, to that. Uh, of course, go right ahead. Hey, you can read these stories simply as adventure stories, too. They don't yes. have to be freighted with all the heavy uh, philosophical stuff that I was just talking about. Uh, they are uh, fundamentally adventure stories. Uh, with very few exceptions, the adventures go badly, but I think that makes them more interesting. Uh, it's, it's hard to write about triumphs uh, and have a lot of suspense in them. Um, so at one level, read these as adventure stories. At another level, perhaps there's a message there that's more substantial that you'll gnaw on and enjoy the taste of. And Nora, thank you and the library for, uh, for putting this on. I appreciate it uh, as an opportunity to talk to people about interesting things. Thank you. And everyone have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.